Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Riverside Community Health Foundation's community Q&A episode. My name is Deidre Kutzenfos, and I run our maternal wellness department, as well as coordinate our doula access program. We'll be doing a series on, on the series on a regular basis with different experts. So make sure that you like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more conversations. We're happy to say that we've received quite a few responses from the community. So stick around for a lot of great information. And I'd like to introduce you to our special guest. Her name is Crystal Duhaney, or otherwise known as Milky Mama. They're so excited to have her with us. Crystal Duhaney is a registered nurse and an international board certified lactation consultant and a breastfeeding mommy of two. After having her second child and returning to work, Crystal struggled with her milk supply and realized that there were very few resources for breastfeeding mothers in her same predicament. So using her knowledge as a nurse and her love of baking, Crystal developed a line of products that supported women's uh, increasing their milk supply. And thus, Milky Mamas was born. Milky Mama has also generated a following of women who help support one another and other um, on, along their breastfeeding journey. Welcome, Crystal. I'm so happy to have you with us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. You want to tell us a little bit more about like what it looks like in uh, what Milky Mamas looks like now, not just how you got to this point? Sure. So for those of you that don't know who I am, like Deidre said, my name is Crystal. Um, and we started basically in my kitchen, um, you know, at my house. And now we are Oh, wow, we have over 100,000 customers and over 500,000 followers on social media. We also have a breastfeeding support center um, in Rancho Cucamonga where we host courses and support groups and basically anything to help support post postpartum parents. Um, right now, unfortunately, due to the obvious circumstances, um, we did have to close our doors temporarily. So Right now we're doing um, everything virtually. So we're providing virtual lactation consultations. We're actually doing those for free because we know that there are so many parents that don't have access to in-person visits. And there are also so many parents that, you know, may have been affected by layoffs or such during this pandemic. So we're offering free virtual consultations to assist with your breastfeeding needs um, or pumping needs. Pumping mamas are breastfeeding too, breastfeeding Absolutely. mamas too. Mm -hmm. And we also are assisting with flange sizing, um, whatever you need in regards to breastfeeding, or if you just need somebody to talk to, we are here for you. That is awesome. I often like to tell moms that breastfeeding is like 10% mechanics, like 90% support. And if you don't have, yes, it is. It's not, it's, it's yeah. really going to work. It's not going to work. Well, so let's jump into our questions. Um, we've got quite a few questions from people in our community who want to know more about breastfeeding. The first one is I'm pregnant. And what should I do if my, my nipples don't stick out? Well, congratulations on your pregnancy first. That's so exciting. We love new babies around here. <laughs> um, and if your nipples don't stick out, it is completely normal um, and completely okay. The great news about breastfeeding is that we breastfeed, we don't nipple feed. So while the mm -hmm. shape of your nipple is kind of important, it's not the end all be all. Um, and in fact, um, as you progress during your pregnancy, it's very likely that your nipples will get larger and erect more. If they don't, and you're still suffering with you know, flat or even possible truly inverted nipples. What you can do is start by maybe using a manual or a, an electric pump um, before latching. That will help erect your nipple a bit so that way it's easier for baby to latch. Alternatively, what you can do is use some manual massage to help erect your nipples. Um, pumping, like I mentioned, you can um, use the Montgomery method where you um, take your finger and your, your thumb and your forefinger and just kind of press back and then squeeze forward. Sometimes that also helps release any adhesions that are keeping your nipple inverted. Um, and also when baby latches on, that suction that they're getting, that you're getting when baby's um, breastfeeding will also help bring that nipple outward to make sure that breastfeeding is going well. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, I guess it just goes on the other, spectrum, other side of the spectrum. Um, for the next question is like, what breast pumps are the best? Are there good and bad breast pumps? So I hate, oh, okay, so full disclosure, you know, none of the breast pump companies in the world are sponsoring me. Um, all I can tell you is based on my personal experience and what I've seen work best for the parents that I serve. So when we talk about good and bad breast pumps, you know, there really isn't a 
bad breast pump per se, but there are some that are more um, effective and preferred. So first, what you want to look for when you're looking for a breast pump, ideally in a perfect world, if it's possible, is you want to look for a closed system breast pump. Um, a closed system breast pump is one that has a membrane that separates the actual pump and your milk from getting into the motor. Um, so there, most of the pumps right now are closed system. There's only a couple that aren't. Um, and those systems just prevent any bacteria or milk getting sucked into the motor, which can grow mold or things like that. You also wanna look for a pump that allows you to pick different flange sizes, super duper important. Just mm -hmm. like a proper latch is very vital to breastfeeding, using a right flange size is the same exact thing. If your flange is too large or too small, it can cause pain, um, clog ducts, it can actually decrease your milk um, production over time. So make sure you're looking for a pump that does allow you to change the flange size um, to fit the proper size according to your needs. Um, and then ideally we want a flange or a pump that has relatively good suction. So we want to see anywhere from about 180 to 350 milligrams of mercury on the suction level. If your pump isn't getting that much suction, it's, it's very possible that your pump may not, may not do a good job at removing milk from your breast effectively, which could also impact your pump output and milk production over time. Um, my favorite pump, again, not sponsored, happens to be the Spectra because it kind of checks all those boxes. It's closed system, it has great hospital grade suction, um, it's portable. Um, other ones that are closed system as well, there is the Amita, which is a closed system pump. Um, not my greatest on the suction, but if that's all you have with your insurance, like if your insurance only provides you with a certain type of pump, then any pump that you use will do as long as you can adjust the flange size and use your hands while you're pumping. If you're not using your hands while you're pumping, then you're not pumping at all. Mm -hmm. That's perfect, yeah. Thank you. Oh, that is super informative. So sometimes this happens, but only one breast is producing milk. This mom wants to know what should she do? So that actually is super common um, in the breastfeeding world here. We call that a slacker boob. I hate calling one of your breasts a slacker. I like or to the call other. it the super producer, like the, the big yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, give that other breast a pep talk, you know, like yeah. don't call it a slacker. <laughs> um, but, but that's just a common term for it. And it's completely normal. If you think about it, nothing really on your body is symmetrical. One mm -hmm. eye may look maybe a little bit bigger or wider than the other. One nostril, same thing. Nothing is symmetrical. In most cases, the only person that the, the breast that doesn't produce much is bothering is the parent. Um, we don't like to see, you know, when we're pumping one bottle with, with three ounces and then the other bottle with an ounce, it just drives us crazy. Um, but in most cases, if baby is latching on, it doesn't bother them very much um, because your breast that produces more will likely compensate for that lesser producing breast. So just because one breast is producing a certain amount does not mean that you can't make enough milk to supply your baby's needs for the day. Uh -huh. What you can do for that if you're noticing that your one breast is producing more than the other, if you're noticing that baby is having issues with milk intake, or if you just have to fix it, if it's just gonna drive you crazy if you don't, um, is start by demanding more from that breast. So latch baby on more frequently on that side, or pump more frequently on that side. Those types of things just to give that breast um, some extra stimulation so we can change that breast from a slacker boob to a you know, super boob or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. I love it. Um, this is also like um, something I taught, I personally talk about in my classes a lot, this next question. Um, and the next question is, is my baby eating enough? I can't tell how much he's eating by volume when he's on the breast versus bottle feeding. And I'm like, maybe we should ask for the next design of humans to have ounce markers on their boobs. Right. So <laughs> so much easier. How, what, yes. are, what can we look for? So how do you know? That is a common question. You know, when you're giving your baby a bottle, um, you can see like, okay, you took three ounces. I know that that's how much you're getting. At the breast, not so much. There are ways that we can check in our lactation, you know, office or your physician's office, which is by a weighted feed. That's not the most accurate, but it does give us a snapshot um, based on how much baby took in. But as a parent at home, the best way to determine how your baby, if your baby's getting enough milk, is their overall disposition. So if you finish nursing your baby and they're nice and happy, chances are they did well. Um, if they are having plenty of wet diapers, if it if it's not going, um, going in, then it can't come out, right? So if they aren't um, having enough wet diapers or poopy diapers, then those are indications that they're not getting enough. 
Um, so basically for the first year of life, we want them first year, the first week of life, we want them to have one wet diaper for every day of life. So your one day old should have one wet diaper at least. Um, and then your two day old should have two wet diapers at least and so on and so forth until about day seven. Around day four or day five of your newborn's life, we wanna start seeing their stool or their poop changing from that dark greenish dark meconium to a nice yellow seedy soft um, poop that we like to see in breastfed babies. If all of that is occurring, then we know that we're doing it okay. Um, after that first week, we like to just see an average of about six to eight wet diapers. And again, nice soft stool. We want our babies to be meeting those developmental milestones. Also um, having steady weight gain. If baby is happy at the breast and happy after they're done and they don't look stressed, you can look at their face, they look nice and relaxed. And um, then those are all great indications that you're doing just fine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this kind of goes back to our next question to what we were talking about in the very beginning. Um, none of the females in my family have been able to successfully breastfeed. Is that a genetic trait? So, okay. So in most cases in the past, at least from my knowledge, from going back and talking to some of my um, older family members, um, Breastfeeding just wasn't something that was promoted. Um, breastfeeding, and especially in, in my culture, you know, it really is something that wasn't promoted, that wasn't talked about. We really didn't breastfeed. So mm -hmm. they may have tried, but just didn't get the support or education that they needed to succeed. Um, however, there are some some conditions that that can prevent you from making milk, and those are very real. You know, a lot of times we say everybody can make plenty of milk, you know, all you need is this. And sometimes there are some chronic con conditions that can affect that. Mm -hmm. So things like insufficient glandular tissue is a, a chronic condition, basically where your breasts just don't grow enough or develop enough glands to make milk. Um, there's also um, hypothyroidism, which can affect your milk production, PCOS, um, sometimes even diabetes can affect it. So those are some conditions that could be potentially genetic that can affect your milk supply. But those are relatively rare in general. Um, in most cases, just because your grandma or your aunts and uncles, whoever, aunts and uncles, or your aunts and cousins couldn't breastfeed, does not mean that you are doomed or that you're not gonna be able to breastfeed. What we do find is that with proper education by taking a breastfeeding course in advance and really finding a great lactation consultant to support you and show you what's normal and how to do things, that most parents are able to successfully breastfeed. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, something else that's common um, that we feel that a lot of people either make the assumption or they are just still wondering, like, does yeah. it hurt when you breastfeed? Is it supposed to hurt when you breastfeed? So this is kind of a, a tricky question because pain is subjective, right? You know, for me, I, I think I have a relatively high pain tolerance, um, but for others, sometimes if you just barely tap them or something, they might be very sensitive and it might be cause discomfort. So when we talk about pain, you know, in most, I always use this, this analogy and it's probably not appropriate, but I'm gonna use it anyway. <laughs> um, when you have a baby and when you're breastfeeding, you know, you're nipples are getting lots of stimulation, like every two hours. And in most cases, most parents don't get that much nipple stimulation when they're breastfeeding from when they, before they had a baby, unless, you know, they have some very exciting life. You know, I'm jealous and I don't have that type of life, but my nipples have never gotten that much stimulation until I gave birth to a baby and started breastfeeding. With that increased stimulation, you are going to have some sensitivity. Um, so it's very common to have some sen some sensitivity, some tenderness. But what's not common and what's not normal is that toe curling, teeth clenching pain that um, you know every nursing session you're just kind of grinning and bearing it. Um, if your nipples are literally falling off, if they are bleeding and cracking and those types of things, definitely not normal. Um, those are all signs of an improper latch. So while it's true that it can be sensitive and, and some tenderness, and some parents may describe that feeling as pain, which is very valid, um, you shouldn't have this toe curling, you know, bleeding experience that is often associated with breastfeeding. So if you're experiencing um, pain that really doesn't go away after the first few seconds of the latch, I would make sure that I seek out a lactation consultant because it's very likely that something is, is amiss there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, what are some things that I could do if I'm not latching enough? 
or lactating enough. Okay. Lactating enough. Yes, I can read. <laughs> so I'm guessing that means like if your milk supply or if you're concerned that your milk supply isn't, you know, mm -hmm. high enough, um, the first thing that you can do is really kind of look at the signs and use the steps that I mentioned earlier to determine, is my milk supply really low? Is baby mm -hmm. peeing enough, pooping enough, having steady weight gain? Um, a lot of times we can misunderstand certain things and think that it's automatically my milk supply. So if for some reason your baby's all of a sudden really fussy, you know, um, that doesn't mean that your supply is low. They could be going through a growth spurt or they could be just fussy. You know, we all have those days where we just aren't in a good mood. Um, so it's really important to assess and, and figure out what is really going on. Um, it's also really important to know that your pump output is not the best indicator of your milk supply. Um, this is because Again, like I mentioned earlier, your flange sizes may be the incorrect size. Your pump suction may not be the best suction. Maybe your pump parts need to be replaced or maybe you're really stressed out while you're pumping, which is um, preventing your letdown, those types of things. So when we talk about um, if you're not making enough milk, first, the first step is making sure that that is accurate. The second step is if you really feel like, you know, your milk supply is low, what you should do is, um, increase the demand, like I mentioned earlier. So start by pumping more frequently or nursing more frequently. You can do what's called a nursing vacation, which is as beautiful as it sounds. It doesn't mean that you go you know, across the world to France breastfeeding your baby. It's really just a vacation, you and your baby just lounging in bed or lounging on the couch and just spending the whole weekend per se, really just breastfeeding on demand. Those are great ways to help increase your supply. Remember, it's really all about supply and demand. The more that you demand from your body, the higher your supply will be. Of course, if none of those are working and you're still really concerned with your supply, then of course, reach out to your lactation consultant for help. Perfect. And what a better time to go on a nursing vacation until right now we really don't have anywhere to be. So. I know. I lock myself in my room and say, I'm going on a nursing <laughs> vacation. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, is it possible to stop breastfeeding for a couple of months and then go back to it? Yes, um, that's actually called relactation. And a fun fact is that even grandmas can relactate. So yeah. just keep that in mind that however long it's been since you've last nursed or since you've last um, pumped is generally how long it will take until your milk supply, you know, resumes completely. So if it's been a month, then just plan on spending about one solid month really kind of doing, you know, a lot of work and determination to increase and to um, establish your milk supply again. Um, but it's definitely possible. Um, parents do it all the time. And if you do need assistance, um, help um, relactating, then reach out to one of us. But basically, like I mentioned, it's supply and demand. So if for some reason you stop pumping or nursing, then you just need to restart again. Usually we recommend doing it about every two to three hours to begin with. And then once your supply is established, then you can just nurse on demand or pump, you know, throughout the day, at least about seven times a day. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Sweet. The next question will continue moving on. Um, what is the likelihood that she'll stop lactating if you're breastfeeding while you're newly pregnant or you're pregnant again? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. It's actually very possible. Um, and this is because a lot of our hormones are really um, affecting our milk supply. Like I mentioned earlier, if you are, you know, if you have thyroid issues, that's a hormone and that can affect your milk production. So when you're pregnant or also when you're on um, hormonal birth control, it does affect your hormonal balance. And because your body is now growing a new baby, um, it may be using those, causing some hormonal, some hormonal changes that might prevent your milk production or decrease it over time. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't, and if your supply maintains, it's usually okay for you to continue nursing your baby during pregnancy. Of course, get clearance from your doctor if you're high risk pregnancy. Um, but if you, but even if you don't make milk, it's perfectly okay to dry nurse your baby. And then once your um, new baby is born, you can certainly mm -hmm. tandem nurse as well. Perfect. And can you just let people know what tandem nursing means just in case they don't understand? Oh, so of course. Tandem nursing means basically nursing two children at the same time. Um, they could be twins. They could be, you know, your toddler or your older baby and your newborn. Um, they could be, you know, um, whoever. <laughs> two, two infants <laughs> two that you're time. nursing at yeah. the same time. You yeah. know, sometimes we have adoptive parents that want to mm -hmm. breastfeed or nurse their adoptive child. So it could be that. Basically, it's just nursing two little humans at the same time. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, next up on our list is what's the, oh, sorry. What is the oldest recommended age for baby to stop breastfeeding? Ooh, that's a good question. Good questions, guys. Mm -hmm. So the oldest recommended time is whenever you and your baby decide to stop nursing. There really is no no time limit. Um, the World Health Organization does recommend um, to offer your baby breast milk um, until at least the age of two. Um, the average worldwide weaning age is actually somewhere around two and a half to seven years old. Mm -hmm. If we think about other cultures in, in other countries, you know, they nurse for much longer because it's just more normal out there. So I'm a firm believer of whenever you and baby decide to, to stop nursing, then that's per the perfect time. Um, but there's no specific age that you should stop. Yeah. You know, and along with this, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. It's like some people are like, how do I stop? What are the steps to weaning? If my child's that age or if I'm tired of breastfeeding, yeah. how do I begin weaning, the weaning process? I completely get it. You know, when you're done, you're done. I've been there. You know, you might get that. So those aversions where you just, or be touched out, where you just no longer want to be touched, mm -hmm. completely normal and completely okay. Um, so the best way to wean is to pick one time. So I always see parents that say, I just quit cold turkey day and night. And that can cause a lot of stress for baby and you if your baby's crying all the time because they really miss that you know, bonding experience or miss nursing. So I always say pick one time. In most cases, the daytime is the easiest time frame to stop, pump, to stop um, nursing. And then after you successfully stop nursing during the day, then you can transition to stopping nursing at night. Um, I also recommend the most gentle method is called the don't offer, don't refuse. It takes a little longer than the more aggressive methods like just weaning cold turkey, um, but it's more gentle. So basically what you would do is you don't offer the breast if, um, you know, when you're out and about, but if baby does happen to ask, then you won't refuse it. Um, a way to kind of speed that along is to um, stay really busy. That's what I would do. So if, if, you know, when I was weaning my children, we would go to the, the zoo, go to the library, do play games, do everything I could do to keep them super busy so that they would forget that we even nursed. I would also avoid sitting in our nursing chair. We had this one spot that we would nurse on and I would avoid that spot like the play because <laughs> I didn't want to just kind of you know, encourage that nursing behavior. Of course, I did miss our bond and it was sad for me too. And experiencing weaning grief is completely normal and completely okay. Um, but that's just what I did and that's what worked for me. And it was the most gentle and the less tears that, you know, it just was, it allowed us to transition our nursing relationship into fun activities that we can still have that wonderful bonding time without nursing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That is awesome. So another question about latching. My baby's having trouble latching on. Are there any tricks or suggestions on how to get her to latch? Oh yeah, that's one of my favorite topics. Okay, so I'll pull out my little props here. I got my big boob and I got my baby. Okay, so this is what I, how I normally like to latch. Um, I personally, when I'm latching a new baby, I love the cross cradle hold um, because it really gives me control of both my breast and my baby. Um, however, you use whatever works best for you, okay? Um, and also keep in mind when I'm uh, holding my baby, I'm not holding the back of their head. What that does is that kind of stimulates a clinching reflex where it prevents them from opening nice and wide. And we really want them to open nice and wide. Instead, I'm placing my thumb and my forefinger right here on the base of their neck very gently just to support their head. I also have my forearm here supporting their spine so that they feel nice and secure and safe. And sometimes what you can do, um, sometimes baby's legs kind of dangle and it makes them kind of feel like they're falling. So you can give them something to brace their feet against, whether it's your forearm or your side or a pillow, just something for them to put some pressure onto their feet will make them nice and comfortable when it's time to latch. I also start with the three principles. I like to do belly to belly. So you always wanna make sure that your baby's belly is touching your belly. And then I also do nipple to nose. Um, a lot of times I see my parents um, lining up their nipple with baby's mouth. When you do that, it only requires baby to open up their mouth just a little bit because the nipple is right there. And so sometimes it won't, it, it won't allow them to open nice and wide. So you actually want to line up your nipple with their nose, okay? Because if you can see, in order for him or this, this baby to latch, he needs to open up his mouth past my nipple because it's lined up with his nose. So this position really encourages a nice open wide mouth. 
So then what I'll do is I will make a C hold. There are tons of holds. There's a U hold, a V hold like this, but I like the C hold. You use whatever works best for you. You wanna make that hold behind the areola, not up here, which I also see is very common. A lot of times we're squeezing right here, um, but you really wanna get as much breast tissue in baby's mouth as possible. So I like to squeeze a little bit um, behind the nipple, about a couple inches right here. And I squeeze it like a sandwich, okay? So imagine you have like a big giant hamburger, like a Big Mac. Um, you can't really bite it the way it is, um, but if you squeeze it down, it's much easier to get a good amount in your mouth. So I'm gonna squeeze my breast, nipple to nose, belly to belly. Then I'm going to point my breast or my nipple upward towards the roof of baby's mouth because that's kind of where we want it to go when baby latches. And then I'm going to rub my nipple right under their nose or on baby's upper lip. Then I'll even kind of say open wide and it just kind of creates a trigger for baby so that every time we latch or every time we, we try to latch, I'll say open wide and then he'll know that it's time to open wide. Once baby opens nice and wide, I'm going to drop the bottom of my breast into baby's bottom jaw and I'm going to scoop his upper lip over. So instead of just bringing him close, it's like a drop and a scoop, okay? So I'm gonna scoop his upper jaw over the top of my nipple. It's very common for you to see some of your areola at the top of his upper lip. That is perfectly fine. I mean, it's a common misconception that all of your areola needs to be in baby's mouth. You know, we're all different. Some people have really large areolas and some people have really tiny areolas. Mm -hmm. So what we really want is baby latching onto the breast tissue and not just onto the nipple because this can cause pain and can also affect how much milk the baby is getting per um, nursing session. Once baby is latched on, we want to look for a nice, either neutral upper lip or lightly flange lip. We don't want the lip tucked in like grandpa because that can cause some pinching and also means that baby's um, latching shallowly. It's also really important too that your baby um, is made their nasal passages are nice and clear. So if you have larger breasts, you may want to kind of hold them back a bit or so. So that way baby's nasal passages are nice and clear. When you're latching, it should be comfortable you should feel more of a tuggy, pulley feel as opposed to like a chompy, bitey, sandpaper, pinchy. Um, and also when you unlatch, your nipple should be nice and round like it went in and not pinched or compressed like lipstick. If you see that, then that usually means that baby was latched on only to your nipple, which means that it wasn't a very productive nursing session. Thank you. That is yeah, this is a trick. I know that a lot of parents are just like, how and what? And, how do I? <laughs> and of course, having a good latch also re means like minimal pain as well. Yes, like exactly. That. that goes back to our previous question too. Right. And then once you guys get the hang of latching, then it'll be super easy and baby will latch in whatever position as they get older, their legs will be in the air. But it's really <laughs> for that first period or that first couple of weeks, you know, practicing a good latch every single time is really important. If it's super painful, um, then I would recommend first trying to fix the latch while baby's latched on because if you unlatch and then latch again the same way, you can potentially re-injure yourself and do more damage. So I always like to just try to, you know, spread their mouth open and see if I can get more breast tissue while they're latched. If I can't, then you want to unlatch and try again. So I know this question is on the minds of a lot of mamas. Um, how long should I wait to breastfeed if I've had a cup of coffee or a glass of wine? And then others in the past, like, can I even consume those things while I'm breastfeeding and lactating? So you can certainly consume coffee when you're breastfeeding. It really depends on your baby. Some babies have, you know, are more sensitive to caffeine than others. So the general rule of thumb is that you can have about three to five cups of coffee a day. Um, and when we say cups, I mean a regular size cup, not a big venti or, you know, anything like that. And then I also mean regular coffee. So nothing like espresso or super, you know, concentrated caffeine. And you also want to keep an eye on your baby. If after having coffee, your baby is bouncing off the walls, then it might be a good idea to cut back a little bit. But if your baby does fine, then you can safely consume coffee. Remember everything in moderation. Um, and in regards to wine, um, that's a personal decision studies show that the amount of alcohol that actually gets into your breast milk is very, very minimal. Of course, the safest way to breastfeed is without drinking, of course. But if you choose to, um, if you, you don't have to pump and dump, you're safe to give that milk to your baby if you choose. If you're concerned about the alcohol in your milk, you can dilute it with previously expressed milk um, from when you weren't drinking alcohol. You can use it for a milk bath. There are tons of other things that you can 
do. Um, just don't dump it down the drain. I hate when people do that. <laughs> you know, that is milk you can actually cry over when it's spilled. I mean, yeah, it really yeah. makes me sad. You know, you worked hard for it, so you can. Mm -hmm. It's you're in most cases you're safe to give it to your baby. Um, but you know, the jury's still out, and there's a lot of controversy over drinking and um, breastfeeding. In fact, the safest time to drink and breastfeed is at the same time. Um, it's, it's the safest to like breastfeed and drink at the same time because it takes a while for the alcohol to metabolize. metabolize. So if you're breastfeeding while drinking, um, you know, it's not even metabolized into your system yet. Will you get some crazy looks? I, I, I sincerely think you will, but it's all, you know, a matter of, of personal preference. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, and true, oh my goodness. Our next one up is I'm planning on going back to work once my company clears us, but I'm still breastfeeding. How long can you freeze and refrigerate breast milk for once it's been pumped? Okay, so the rule of thumb is um, you can freeze, you can refrigerate breast milk for about four days, according to the CDC. Um, I'm a huge fan of smell it and taste it. Smells good, tastes good, then it's good. Um, because, you know, after four days, it doesn't necessarily mean that the milk is bad. It could just mean that maybe some of the nut nutrients are kind of breaking down a bit, um, but it certainly doesn't mean that it's not perfectly good breast milk for baby. So if it doesn't smell good or taste good, then it's a good idea to use it for a milk bath or, you know, send it off to make some breast milk jewelry or something. Um, in the freezer, it's good for about six to 12 months. Of course, that depends on where it's stored in the freezer. So if you if you store it on the door where there's a lot of temperature fluctuations when you're opening the freezer and closing it, then it will likely last um, for less amount of time. But if you store it in the back of the freezer where it's nice and cool, then and the temperature is consistent, then it can last for about 12 months. Perfect. So I know this is on a lot of minds, our next question of families, especially under um, the circumstances. And the question is, can COVID-19 be transmitted through breast milk? I, I have not been tested because I have no symptoms, but I've read you can be symptomless and have the virus. My fear is that I could have the virus and then transfer it to my son. That's a wonderful question, especially with what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, so current research has not shown that breast milk, that COVID can be transferred via breast milk. Um, I think the biggest concern, according to the CDC and the World Health Organization, is actually transmitting it via our respiratory, in, respiratory secretions, just like with everyone else. So if you are suspected to have COVID-19, or if you have tested positive for it, or even if you just have a simple cold or something, um, it's a good idea to just practice good, um, you know, respiratory hygiene practices. So specifically with COVID-19, if you do have it while breastfeeding or pumping, you should wear a mask. Um, of course, wash your hands before and after. If you do need to cough, make sure you're coughing away from baby. Those types of things to limit baby's exposure. But in reality, if you were infected, your baby has very likely already been exposed because your baby is sharing a house with you. Um, but a really interesting fact is we actually have um, in our in our private Facebook group, one of our moms did test positive for COVID-19 and she was hospitalized. And after she recovered, she sent her breast milk off to a research study. And when they tested her breast milk, they found that her breast milk contained very powerful antibodies to COVID-19 in her breast milk. So we don't quite know what that means yet. The research is still out, but I thought that that was super impressive because not, she has two children and neither of them um, were infected, both of them were nice and healthy. So um, that kind of goes to show like, you know, in most cases with most illnesses, if you do, con you know, contract an illness, in most cases, there are only a couple where we don't recommend it, um, is that you should continue to breastfeed because it's passing those valuable antibodies to your baby to help prevent them from getting sick or to help um, shorten the duration or the intensity of their illness if they do happen to get it. It just it blows my mind every time how amazing yeah. breast milk is. It's so All great. Right. Our bodies are just so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking about how amazing breast milk is, it really leads nicely into our next question. Is my baby deprived of essential nutrients when I swap in formula for breast milk? So what is lacking? What could be lacking? So that's a tough question because, you know, formula has saved lots of babies' lives, you know, mm -hmm. in, in instances where there was no breast milk or mom couldn't breastfeed or mom was separated, you know, there was formula. Um, if there was no donor milk available, then there was formula. So formula is not poison. It's not bad. You know, um, we do know that breast milk is the best milk for baby, but sometimes breastfeeding doesn't work out. So breast, you know, formula, there's really there is a difference because your breast milk is custom made for your baby. I always like to say that your breast milk is like 
a custom made like bowl of chicken soup for your baby. Your baby sends signals to your body and your body responds by making the perfect milk. If your baby is hot, your, your body will adjust its milk. If your baby is growing good through growth, growth store, your, your milk will make, might be more caloric to meet those needs. So your body is constantly adjusting, which I think is so amazing. Unfortunately, formula can't do that because formula is man-made and it's not really listening to your baby's um, to your baby's signals, um, but formula is a, an accepted alternative. For what we know, breast milk has tons and tons of ingredients that formula does not have, but it does not mean that if you are a formula feeding mom, that your baby will be less healthy or love you less or be less intelligent, those types of things. You have to do what's best for you and your baby. Yeah. And it's good to know that just one drop of breast milk contains about 3 million cells in it that are beneficial for your baby. So even if you can just give your baby one drop of breast milk and the rest formula, you're doing an amazing thing for your baby. Mm-hmm. Again, blowing my mind. That's blowing my mind. <laughs> Oh, so even though it's so amazing and there's so many cool things about it, uh, this mom wants to know, I find myself so tired after I breastfeed and sometimes I have to fight off falling asleep while I'm breastfeeding. Is it normal? Is there something I can do to help with this? Yeah, you know, and that really depends on the age of your baby because let's face it, you know, you're a new mom and you are exhausted. I don't know any new mom that is like, I'm so well well rested. I I can, you know, do this all day. Um, It's exhausting being a new parent, whether you're breastfeeding or not. Um, And top that off with, you know, waking frequently to feed your baby. It's normal to feel tired. What I always recommend and I always tell parents is to don't hesitate to ask for help. If you have a partner at home, um, ask them for help. If if you can maybe pump at night to get some sleep because your sleep is just as important to your milk supply as Mm -hmm. baby's latch. And if you're falling asleep and it's not safe for baby, then that's a a huge concern. So I would find ways to adjust. That's the beauty of being a parent is that you can adjust your journey based on what you need. If you need more sleep at night and you know staying awake at night is not working for your emotional health or just in general then there are ways to adjust so maybe try to pump at night and maybe have a partner feed baby a bottle if you have assistance at home if not what I would do before falling asleep or before baby goes to sleep is when I'm breastfeeding I would just do some breast compressions to squeeze as much milk into baby's tummy as I can in hopes to kind of space out those feedings at night to see if that helps Um, But just know that this too shall pass. I promise you won't be exhausted forever. Um, I promise it gets easier and you just have to cope and adjust to what works best for you. Yeah. It is just a season. It is just a season. Yeah. It's going to last forever. Oh, it does. But this is another (laughs) question. It really does. Um, but there's another newborn question from a newborn mom. My breast feed, my breasts have been painfully engorged. I've tried taking warm showers and hand pumping, and expressing heat packs and ice packs. They're still rock hard. Is there anything else I can um, I can do to help relieve the pain? Yes. Okay. So especially if you have a newborn, um, it's very common to be engorged because your body has no idea how much milk to make. It just knows, okay, there's a human born. I need to feed it. So in the most cases, in the first few weeks. Your breasts are going to make, or your body's going to make just an insane amount of milk. Um, And then once your baby responds by nursing, or, you know, once you tell your body how much milk to make, if you're exclusively pumping, then your supply will regulate to your baby's needs. Um, So I would say continue to nurse on demand. Additionally, if you're pumping and hand expressing, you just want to do it for comfort. So don't pump a full pumping session to, you know, completely empty your breast because then you're telling your body, hey, you didn't make enough milk, make more, which can further compound the issue. So you wanna just um, pump or express milk for comfort, continue to nurse baby on demand, hot showers are nice. Um, What you can also do if it's causing a lot of pain is you can take um, a non inset, so like a Tylenol or something to help relieve with the pain. If you're suffering from an oversupply, um, you can also help you can also help by expressing for comfort and putting cold packs and alternating those with warm packs. If it's making it difficult for baby to latch while you're engorged, you can do what's called reverse pressure softening. Basically what that is, is you take your engorged breast and you're gonna take two fingers on each side and you're just gonna press inward 
and you're going to hold it for about 30 seconds and then you're going to go around and just kind of go around in a circle on all areas of your areola and that'll help move some of that tissue backwards or the fluid backwards and make your areola um, nice and soft for baby to latch so that they can empty your milk effectively okay but i think the most important thing is to make sure that you are just expressing enough so that you're comfortable and not pumping you know for a good whole 10 to 15 minute session because you're just making the problem worse by telling your body to make more milk. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that one. Um, it's another question about COVID-19. We know that, of course, there's actual issues that have to do with breastfeeding, but the other fallout is being a new mama during COVID-19 has been challenging for me. How can yeah. I still get the postpartum support that I need, um, that I know that I need, and what options do I have? That is such a great question and, and such an important question right now. Um, you know, it's important to know that everyone practically is closed and we're all shut down, but there are some really amazing providers that have taken their, you know, in-person practices to virtual. So there are many virtual options where you can get support. So whether you're suffering with, you know, from postpartum depression or you're feeling some symptoms of postpartum anxiety, you can reach out to a, um, a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist, you can reach out to somebody virtually who can really just listen to your concerns and give you some guidance. Um, prescriptions, if necessary, can also be done virtually. Lactation consultations can be done virtually. Like I mentioned, we're offering those for free. Um, you know, postpartum doulas I've heard are doing virtual services as well. So we're really all kind of banding together to adjust to this um, you know, this pandemic that we're dealing with to provide services virtually if possible. Um, if, if, of course, it's an emergency and you really need to see someone, um, your physician has emergency um, hours. I do know that there are some psychiatrists or those essential workers that are offering um, emergency in-person visits. So it's really just important to find out who your local resources are and if they're seeing people in person or if it's virtual and just kind of taking advantage of any any resource that you have right now. Um, don't go it alone because this is an adjustment for all of us, especially for new parents that, that might be grieving the experience that they hoped for now that it's different, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to band together, find other parents that are going through the same thing, um, talk to you know, your postpartum doula, if you have one, talk to a support group, find a support group if it's available. Um, really just find any resources um, there are tons available. If you need more help, I, I can work on compiling a list of all the virtual resources that are available during this time. That's really awesome. And like, as you compile those, they'll just, you'll be sharing them through your social media. Yeah, I'll probably resources. share them in our Instagram stories or send out an email because there are, uh, there are um, tons and tons of resources available for both pregnant parents and um, postpartum parents that are virtual right now. And although it's not ideal and it's not the same as really sitting across from someone, um, you know, we have to be safe and mm -hmm. it, it's just unfortunately, you know, what we have to deal with right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was no a lot, lot of incredible information. Um, and yeah, I, those I are like really good questions. <laughs> all over the place. Um, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all this amazing knowledge. Um, if you want to learn more about Milky Mama, be sure to follow her on Instagram at Milky Mama LLC and Facebook at Milky Mama LLC. And her website is milky-mama.com. You can find all sorts of information and resources. Yeah. And like she mentioned before, she's providing, um, she and her team are providing uh, free consults at this time. And mm -hmm. look out for some of those free um, online resources yes. as well. Um, we're so glad that you were able to join us. And please remember, we'll be doing this community Q&A series on a regular basis with different experts. So make sure that you like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more great conversations, or you can visit our website at rchf.org. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Take care. Yes.